Hello everyone, now we will discuss on the topic advanced secondary processes part 2 and in this class we will discuss on phytoremediation, some fundamentals, types, advantages and disadvantages and also we will discuss phycoremediation. As mentioned earlier that in phytoremediation the living plants are used for the remediation of wastewater and the soil, the contaminated soil. We have seen that when we use microbes for the wastewater treatment, then the microbes degrade the organic compound and they can take energy from it that is heterotrophic bacteria or microorganism there may be chemototrophic microorganisms and autotrophic microorganisms different types of. So, when we are using the plant living plant, so living plant also can take up the organic materials into the cell and that can be metabolized later on and uh, there are some detoxification mechanism also if the foreign material which is taken up by the plant are having some toxic characteristics. So, there will be some detoxification mechanism. So, the pollutants which are available in the water or in the soil that may be stored locally or may be converted to less toxic form or may be stored locally or that may be transmitted from root to shoot to leaves. So, this way the pollutant will be transmitted and after certain time, so the upper parts of the plants can be harvested and can be used to recover this if it is heavy metal is there or not, if, if heavy metal is there so that can be recovered or can be processed with care with to eliminate the contamination, the chance of further contamination. So, phytoremediation is a cost effective, environment friendly and aesthetically pleasing approach most suitable for the developed as well as developing countries. Okay, so, phytoremediation is not a very new concept you know, because if we go to villages we will see that uh, there are many uh, low lands are there, ponds are there, when aquatic plants are there and they purify the water of the pond. Okay. But uh, this concept we can develop in engineered way and that is called artificial wetland. So, that can be uh, used and people are using in different parts, it can be used in developed as well as uh, developing countries and it is a general term used to describe the clean up of contaminants using living plants and or to remediate sites by removing pollutants from soil and water plants break down or degrade organic pollutants or contain and stabilize metal contaminants by acting as filters or traps. These plants can then be subsequently harvested, processed and disposed of in an environment friendly manner. It is used for treating many classes of contaminants including heavy metals, petroleum hydrocarbons, chlorinated solvents, pesticides, explosives and landfill leachates. So, you see here this figure we see. So, pollutants are may be present in the water or may be present in the soil. So, that will come through the roots into the plant and that is going towards the stem and towards the leaf. So, depending upon the nature of the pollutants, so that will be translocated may be available here, may be transmitted to shoots or may be transmitted to leaves also, but that will depend upon the nature of the plant, the nature of the pollutants etcetera. So, the roots of established plants absorb metal elements and translocate them to the above ground shoots where they accumulate. So, maybe shoot or maybe leaves after sufficient plant growth and the metal accumulation the above ground portions of the plant are harvested and removed resulting in the permanent removal of the metals from the site. So, from the site the metal is coming, but where it is going it is going to the biomass. So, we have to handle this biomass mo with more precaution. Now, we will see how the detoxification mechanism is applicable for plants. So, the processes such as exclusion, 
that is prevention of metal ion from entering the cytosol through the action of plasma membrane. So, exclusion is one mechanism, another is immobilization, another is chelation that is synthesis of metal binding proteins and or metal ion chelation and compartmentalization of the metal ions in vacuole. So, these are the major mechanisms which work on the detoxification of the heavy metals which are available in the water and soil. So, here we see these are different metals. So, we have some phytochelators and then chelate formation is there. So, metal chelates, so this either this can be detoxified or that will be sequestered. So, that will be sequestered and then from root to shoot, from root to shoots it will be translocated. So, there are there are basically the mechanism translocation mechanism is there and that will depend upon the nature of the pollutants and the plants we are using as you have mentioned earlier. And we can quantify this term that how the concentration of the pollutants will increase that is bio concentration factor that will also depend upon the plant species and the pollutant types. So, this can be defined as iron concentration in plant tissues dry weight by initial iron concentration in solution and then translocation factor iron concentration in stems or leaves dry weight microgram per gram divided by iron concentration in roots that is microgram per gram because the root is in direct contact with the soil or water or the contaminants present in the soil and water and then it is accumulating there and then it is trans it is translocated from root to stem and stem to leaves gradually. So, these are the formula which are used for the quantifications of the pollutants in the stem and leaves and phytoremediation methods may be of different types then we will be seeing those types here. So, phytostabilization. So, this refers to the holding of contaminated soils in place by vegetation and immobilization physically or chemically of contamination. So, for more understanding we can say that some biochar is also used in soil as a soil conditioner. So, that can also capture heavy metals and other pollutants and remain as such in the soil, but that is not available to the plants okay, for vegetation. And phyto extractions the use of metal accumulating plants that translocate metals from the soil to their roots and concentrate that is those are extracting the metals from the soil or water and that is concentrated on their roots. And rhizosphere bio remediation, so this occurs in the root zone also known as phytostimulation or plant assisted bio remediation and this type of plants the root system is very uh, robust and very huge amount of roots are available and the pollutants are remediated in this root zone and rhizofiltration use of plants to solve concentrate and or precipitate metal contaminants from surface, surface waters the treatment wetlands or ground water. So, this is the rhizofiltration so that use of plants to solve concentrate and or precipitate metal contaminants from surface waters and phyto transformation that uptake of contaminants from soil and ground water by plants and their subsequent transformation in the roots, stems and leaves. So, these are the different types of these are the different types of phytoremediation methods and we will compare here say phyto extraction that is the process goal is contaminant extractions and capture. So, soil sediment sludge may be your media where these are available and metals are extracted and some plants are suitable for this that is Indian mustard. So, penny crash, sunflowers, hybrid poplars and the status, status is that lab, pilot and field applications and rhizofiltration that contaminant extractions and capture is the main objective and ground water and surface water is used for this case and metals, radio radicals, radionuclides are the contaminants investigated and sunflower, sunflower, Indian mustard, water hyacinth have been used 
and lab and pilot scale study has been performed. And phytostabilization, contaminant fixation at the root zone and in the roots. So, that is the main objective and metals and brassica, juncea and poplars have been used in the field application. Similarly, rhizosphere degradation that is destructions in the root zone that is the main objective that means detoxification will take place in the root zone. So, that is rhizosphere degradation and groundwater soil sediments large anyone can be used and then organic compounds are basically degraded in this process and red mulberry hybrid poplar grasses cattle rice. So, these are some example of plants which have been used in field application. Phytodegradation the objective is to contaminate destructions by internal processes and groundwater soil sediments anything has been used and then organic compounds including chlorinated solvents pesticides phenols and, and munitions have been used algae stone oat and hybrid poplar black willow bald cypress have been used in the field demonstration and phytos volatilization the objective is contaminant extraction from media and release in air. So, from groundwater soil sediment have been investigated and chlorinated solvents mercury arsenic selenium has been used as a target pollutants and poplar alfalfa black locust Indian mustard have been used in lab and field application. These are the different methods which have been investigated for the phytoremediations of metals and other pollutants and there are some advantages of phytoremediation like say the cost of the phytoremediation is lower than that of traditional processes easy to implement and maintain the plants can be easily monitored. There is also possibility of the recovery and reuse of valuable metals by using phyto mining. So, this new area is also developing that phyto mining that means the metal containing plants which will be getting. So, that will be used for the extractions of the metals once again. It is the least harmful method because it preserves the natural state of the environment and is aesthetically pleasing. Solar energy is used to drive the cleansing activity making it is energy efficient useful for treating a broad range of environmental contaminants including nuclear waste. One type of plant can, can get rid of a number of contaminants. It has some disadvantages also like phytoremediation is limited to sites with low to medium contaminant concentrations. It is not very suitable for high concentration removal. It is restricted to sites with contaminations as deep as the roots of the plants being used and may take several years to remediate. Success is dependent on the tolerance of the plant to the types of pollutants present and dependence on climatic conditions, possible bioaccumulations of contaminants which then pass into the food chain from primary level consumers upwards. So, that is also one drawback of this that pollutants may be accumulated and that can be passed upward to the food chain. And this slide shows us some photograph artificial wetland where the plants have been grown and used for the treatment of the wastewater and this is one lab scale setup. So, in the laboratory scale also providing light control light and the plants that is Vetiveria gigenoids have been grown here. So, for the removal of arsenic fluoride etcetera from the contaminated water. Now, we will see here some plants having heavy metal removal capacity like say chromium, copper, zinc, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, lead, selenium all these heavy metals have been removed using different types of plant species as mentioned here. Okay, it is for chromium, for these are the for coppers, these are for zinc, these are for mercury and this is for cadmium, this is, these are for arsenic, these are for lead and these are for selenium. Now, we will discuss on the phyco remediation. So, in case of phyco remediation algae is used for the removal of the pollutants. So, algae are autotrophic and some algae are heterotrophic and in presence of sunlight some algae produces food, but in absence of sunlight they use organic carbon also. So, 
the algae both micro and macro can be used for the treatment of wastewater. At the same time it will give us some algal biomass that can be used for bio oil production or biogas productions or as a renewable energy feedstock. So, that is the one another advantage of this process also and the growth of this microalgae is very fast. So, the efficiency of the process is, is also very good if the concentration level is in lower side. And you see here if we the phycoremediation is the use of macro or microalgae for the reduction or biotransformation of pollutants including nutrients and harmful chemicals and there are basically two types of uh, phycoremediation system one is open system photobioreactor and closed system photobioreactor. So, why it is photobioreactor because the algae produces food through photosynthesis in presence of sunlight. So, that is photobioreactor and this is one flow sheet of the open system photobioreactor. So, here we are getting the feeding and this is our open pond say. So, waste water is getting entry here, it is getting some residence time. So, microalgae is growing here and pollutants are being taken off by the microalgae and when it is going out we are harvesting the microalgae. So, microalgal concentration we are maintaining at the same time we are getting treated water here, we are also getting harvested algal biomass. So, two benefits we are getting. So, this is open system, but in case of closed system this is not in open in contact to air. So, that will be in a closed vessel and in that case we can get different types of closed photobioreactors like vertical tubular, horizontal tubular, plate and plastic bag systems. Now, here we see the horizontal tubular photobioreactor. These are the photobioreactors in parallel arrangement. So, here the waste water is going through it and algae is growing. Okay. So, then it is coming out then we are doing some harvesting. So, after harvesting we are getting some algal biomass, we are getting waste water. So, some part of that waste water and this harvesting biomass is recycled here. Okay. So, this is used for degassing because here the algae is working on it. So, this algae is generating oxygen in presence of sunlight. So, this water we are sending here. So, that will be having some oxygen that needs to be removed. So, that is the air is sent. So, oxygen will be removed and that is degassing section is there and cooling water arrangement is also needed to maintain the temperature because the due to the presence of sunlight the temperature will be higher will raise and that temperature will be reduced by the cooling water arrangement. So, this is the flow sheet of a solar ray horizontal photobioreactor tubes. Now, this is a vertical column photobioreactor you see here the vertical columns are there. So, this is the entry from that side it is coming. So, from that side it is coming. So, water is coming and then so this is getting out and it is in out in like this. So, this is our first column out is the into the second column, second column out is the into the third column, third column out, fourth column, fourth column out into the fifth column. So, then from fifth column it is going as a final treated water. So, after harvesting we will be getting the treated water. So, this is your vertical column photobioreactor and similar way flat panel photobioreactor which looks like a flat panel. So, inlet and outlet we will get. So, these are closed photobioreactor. Now, we will see the difference between the open and closed photobioreactor. So, if we compare these two types of photobioreactor with respect to some parameters like say required space. So, for open ponds it is high space required, but in case of closed photobioreactor lesser space is required and water loss is very high in case of open ponds, but it is less in case of closed photobioreactor and carbon dioxide loss is also again high in case of open ponds and low in case of closed photobioreactor. Oxygen concentration usually low enough because of continuous spontaneous outgas in case of open pond and 
uh, it for close photoreactors it requires gas exchange devices that is oxygen must be removed to prevent inhibition of photosynthesis or photo oxidative damages that we have already mentioned. And then temperature that highly variable some control possible by pond depth only and for closed photoreactor cooling often required and temperature control can be done more precise and shear low shear is, uh, is experienced in case of open pond and high shear is experienced in case of closed pond closed photoreactors. Cleaning in case of open ponds no cleaning no issue, but closed pond it requires cleaning and wall growth and dart reduce light intensity and contamination risk there is a good risk for open pond, but there is low risk for closed photoreactor. Biomass quality again open ponds variable and is better and it is reproducible in closed photoreactor. Biomass concentration low between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5 gram per liter for open pond system where air this is high between 2 to 8 gram per liter for closed photoreactor and production flexibility only few species possible difficult to switch in case of open ponds, but this is production flexibility very high in case of closed photoreactor. And process control and reproducibility is limited in case of open ponds and more control and reproducibility is possible for closed photoreactor. Now, we will compare different closed photoreactor like say tubular photoreactor, column photoreactor and flat panel photoreactor. So, here we will see that biomass yield is maximum in case of tubular PBR followed by flat panel and then column PBR. The exposed surface area of light illumination maximum in tubular followed by flat panel and column PBR. Again manufacturing cost is maximum in flat panel PBR followed by column and then tubular PBR. Problem due to O2 and CO2 accumulation maximum in case of tubular PBR followed by flat panel and then column PBR and scale up possibility very high in case of tubular PBR followed by column PBR and then flat panel PBR it is very low possibility and maintenance cost is medium in case of tubular and low in case of column PBR and flat panel PBR. Now, we will discuss on the harvesting of algal biomass. So, algal growth is taking place in the photoreactor and when the waste water is going out we are harvesting the, uh, the algal biomass. So, in the treated water the concentration of algal biomass is very very less. Okay. So, then we have to concentrate it. So, there are basically two steps for its concentration. The first step that is bulk harvesting where microalgal suspensions and then it is concentrated through the sedimentation, flocculations and flotation. So, that water is separated and we are getting condensed microalgae that is 2 to 7 percent dry weight concentrated biomass we are getting. Then this will be thickened further by using centrifugation, ultrasonic agitation, filtration or any of these or any combination then we will be getting pure water and we will be getting the concentrated algal biomass. And here we will see some comparison. So, these are the different microalgae species used for different study like say vacuum filtration and then tangential flow filtration, centrifugation, centrifugation. So, here we will see the effectiveness. So, it is not mentioned here, but 70 to 89 percent for tangential flow filtration and centrifugation greater than 95 percent here greater than 90 percent and these are the conditions which have been investigated. So, it is seen that for centrifugation we will be getting more effectiveness and some other examples different microalgal species used and different methods like dispersed flotation, flocculation followed sedimentation, flocculation followed by sedimentation micro bubble flotation etcetera. Here also the effectiveness are given. So, somewhere it is 93.6 percent, here it is 60 percent, here 99.2 percent recovery and these are the conditions which have been used for this harvesting process. Another two examples are here that is these are the microalgal species used and this is the method gravity sedimentation and flocculation. Again the effectiveness are given and conditions are also given. So, here 
it is getting 60 percent effectiveness here 85 to 90 percent biomass recovered and 95 percent biomass was recovered. So, these are having sodium hydroxide was used as flocculent at pH between 11 and 12. So, these are the different methods which have been investigated for the harvesting of the algal biomass and uh, this slide gives us some comparison of some algal harvesting techniques like say gravity sedimentation, inorganic chemical flocculation, polyelectrolyte flocculation, centrifugation, filtration, natural and pressurized and flotations and auto flocculation. If we compare the relative cost and yield TSS percentage, what is the percentage of solid we are getting or energy uses, then we see this is the scenario, different methods, different relative cost, different TSS yield, different energy uses. So, here maximum is 90 percent TSS through inorganic chemical flocculation and here energy usage is 0.33. So, this we see lower side usage energy usage and higher size TSS, but gravity sedimentation is having the lowest energy usage, but the TSS yield is very very less with respect to other method. So, we can select one on the basis of our situation or type of microalgae we are using, type of density of the microbial cells etcetera and we can select any one suitable process for the harvesting purpose. And now we will see some example of wastewater treatment using algae like say municipal wastewater have been used and chlorella species has been used and municipal wastewater raw and some autoclaved have been used. So, people have tried to find out you know, whether there is any effect of the other microorganisms present in it. So, that is autoclaved means no other microorganisms when here are raw means many other microorganisms are present. So, that way that way the investigations have been carried out for the nitrogen removal, phosphorus removal and CO2 removal and different conditions have been used that is initial NP and COD concentration as given here light intensity and batch days inoculation what is the percentage of inoculation that is also given. So, these are the different conditions which have been used by different researchers for the removal of nitrogen, phosphorus and COD using different microalgae and different wastewater sources. Some other examples are soybean processing wastewater, piggy wastewater. So, industrial wastewater also has been used. So, different microorganisms have been tested and nitrogen phosphorus CO2 removal has been investigated. So, there are these are very old literature that is 11 and 2013 by the meantime many other research have come up and this area is being developed gradually and it has been found that this algal treatment may be very promising for the treatment of low organic load municipal wastewater treatment purpose. So, up to this in this class thank you very much for your patience.